is 20 years since the United States and its allies invaded Iraq amid the war on terror, a full-scale military operation against the regime of dictator Saddam Hussein involving over 160,000 troops, mostly American and British. The US President George W. Bush and British Prime Minister Tony Blair both claimed Saddam Hussein possessed weapons of mass destruction, which could be used against the West within 45 minutes. The claims, though, even though the UN teams had carried out more than 700 inspections in Iraq and had found no WMDs. On February the 5th, 2003, though, the US Secretary of State told the UN the evidence was clear. The fourth source, an Iraqi major who defected, confirmed that Iraq has mobile biological research laboratories in addition to the production facilities I mentioned earlier. We must not shrink from whatever is ahead of us. We must not fail in our duty and our responsibility to the citizens of the countries that are represented by this body. A month later, Operation Iraqi Freedom began with a so-called shock and awe campaign of aerial bombardment followed by a ground invasion. That without then the full support of the Security Council, including opposition from France. In just three weeks, Baghdad fell and five days later, the hometown of Saddam Hussein Tikrit followed suit. During his dictatorship, Saddam Hussein had turned the once little-known city into the one of the most beautiful in the country, whilst also giving considerable power to regional tribes. Its fall, though, marked a real symbolic moment in the end of the regime that confirmed decisively at the end of the year with the arrest of Saddam Hussein just south of Tikrit and eventually his execution. Twenty years on, though, what is the birthplace of Saddam Hussein like now? And what has become of its residents? Will you see Wasserman with Cole Stangler revisit Tikrit for France 24? Tikrit in the heart of Iraq. For its 140,000 residents, there's a name that lives in infamy. Saddam Hussein, who was born here in 1937 more precisely, on the outskirts of town in a village named Al Auja. That's where we are today. Outside the village, a group prevents us from entering. What are you doing here? Are you here to visit Saddam's tomb? No, we just want to film the village. This is a military zone. You're not allowed to be here. You need to leave immediately. OK, no problem. Tell us where to go to get authorization. It's not allowed. Show me the papers for your vehicle. For years, Al Auja has been a ghost town, inaccessible to the public. It's not secure here. Leave. Why isn't it secure? There's nobody here. It's not secure, that's all. Call our commander in Baghdad if you'd like. These armed guards aren't from the army or the police. They belong to a paramilitary group close to Iran, the former sworn enemy of Saddam Hussein. There's no way to negotiate. We need to leave. It's better not to approach the city of al -Awja. The groups there have put up cement blocks and barracks to keep everything under surveillance. The residents were moved out a while ago, and armed groups prevent them from coming back. Marwan al-Jabari is a big name in Tikrit. The son of a very influential family, he's been fighting for years to try to make this village accessible to its former inhabitants. Just look at the distance between al Auja and Tikrit. It's barely a few kilometers. It's absurd. Residents are allowed to go back to Tikrit, but not to their village. Marwan is the spokesman of a local tribal council. As they do every month, this assembly is meeting up to discuss politics. The case of Al Auja has been on the table for years. Hello to everyone. Thanks for being here today. We have a lot of topics to cover. First, the general situation in Iraq and the political gridlock, but also the situation of displaced people. 
above all, as you know, those from Aluja. You should know that last week we spoke with the government ministers concerned with the question of displaced people. We brought up the problems in this region, including Alauja, that's emptied of its residents. A member of the Abu Nasir tribe, which Saddam Hussein used to belong to, takes the floor. Let's just say it as it is. All of this is a private affair. This is political because it's the birthplace of President Saddam Hussein. It doesn't represent anything else. It's completely insignificant for them. We've met everyone from the President of the Republic and the Prime Minister to local level officials. And what's come out of it? Nothing. Today, only 280 families from this tribe still live in Tikrit, down from 5,000 in 2003. Even if they've proven they didn't play a role in the old regime, these men and women say they're still paying for the cost of their origins 20 years later. The problem is, the forces that control the ground are multidirectional, and it complicates our exchanges. The army is the army. The police is the interior ministry. But when it comes to the popular mobilization forces, they're not all on the same side. They answer to different commands. Even when we get a positive response from one side, others can put the decision into question. We tried to contact these armed factions. Only the group known as Jundal Imam, the soldiers of the Imam, agreed to meet. An appointment scheduled in the center of town in one of Saddam's former palaces, with a promise to then access Al Auja. We all belong to the Popular Mobilization Forces, and we were some of the first to enter Tikrit in 2015, after the liberation from ISIS. All these men are Shia, and they aren't from the region, which is majority Sunni. First, they want to take us to one of the palaces where ISIS committed one of its worst crimes before the city was liberated. They say the acts of violence were organized by former loyalists of Saddam Hussein. There are still a lot of Saddam Hussein supporters in the region, and these people benefited a lot from the Ba'ath Party at the time. They wanted back in power. A lot of them joined Al-Qaeda and ISIS to try to avenge Saddam and the Ba'ath Party. In this palace, for example, which used to belong to Saddam, this is where the Spiker massacre took place. In June 2014, between 1,000 and 1,700 Shia soldiers from the Spiker Air Base were reportedly executed in cold blood. The young soldiers weren't from here, the traitors were. They spread their terror, they manipulated them, they told them to leave their base and said everything would be all right, but they were being led to their deaths. Yes, the traitors were loyal to Saddam and to ISIS. This massacre is among the reasons why these groups refuse to let residents of al auja return. According to our sources, several members of Saddam Hussein's tribe did indeed participate in the massacre, but an overwhelming majority of the assailants belonged to another tribe in the region. It can't be proven that this bloodbath was organized to avenge the former dictator. After the liberation of Tikrit in 2015, these Shia factions were accused of sectarianism. I hope all these places will end up as sanctuaries for the Shia families of the martyrs. al auja as a future site of pilgrimage for supporters of Saddam Hussein. That's the scenario these armed groups want to avoid at all costs. It's the real reason behind the reinforced security. This is where the ex-dictator has been buried since 2006. Marwan's father organized the transport of the body. At the beginning, the Iraqi government intended to bury Saddam Hussein in a secret location in Baghdad. But when the delegation led by my father arrived, they insisted on bringing back the remains to bury him at home in his own province. They knew it would create a lot of problems if he was buried in a secret location in Baghdad. 
Once they agreed on this, they knew armed groups would try to intercept the body during the transfer, which was originally set to take place over land. Abdullah al-Jabari, my father, had a long discussion with the Americans. He requested that they transport the body in one of their planes. They responded that it was very sensitive, of course, and that they needed authorization from the highest level of state. After an hour, they received authorization from President Bush to transport the body of Saddam Hussein in an American plane. Saddam Hussein was laid to rest in his hometown of Al Auja. These photos shared by former residents show the mausoleum built to hold his remains, with clothes of the former dictator on display inside. It drew in visitors from around the country. It wasn't until later that the Iraqi government wanted to close this room. Then there was a war against ISIS and the room was bombed during operations to liberate the city. Today, nobody knows where the body of Saddam Hussein is. Rumors abound that regional tribes exhumed his remains before the arrival of ISIS and reburied the body in a secret location. In Tikrit, our visit of Saddam's palaces continues. In these ruins, the soldiers of the Imam serve as tourist guides with a speech that seems well-practiced. We must conserve these palaces so that they bear witness to this terrible period. After we insist on entering al Auja, they want us to meet other officials. Tell him to wait at the base. No, they didn't film. Though ultimately, it just feels like we're being led on. Despite our requests, in the end, nobody agrees to show us the ghost town. To better unlock the mysteries of this place, we travel then to Erbil in Iraqi Kurdistan. Here, some of Al-Ajah's former residents live in exile. Here's the house I'm renting today. I don't have the means to buy it. It costs around $600 a month. And it's hard because the state has stopped paying my salary since 2015. Yes, it's true. We came to power thanks to the Ba'ath Party. And our tribe, the Abu Nazir tribe, benefited a lot from it. But today, the party has fallen, and so has our authority. A brutal fall which has hurt the entire tribe. The proof of a desire to exact political revenge, according to the head of the tribe. You know these accusations of being with ISIS. In reality, there's not a single tribe in the region of Salahuddin that doesn't have one or two members who joined ISIS. Ours are dead now, or we don't know where they are. They're certainly not in the country. For the past seven years, they've been far from their native lands. Since the Shia militias took control of their village, none of them have managed to make it back there, even for just a day. But thanks to first-hand accounts and satellite imagery, they've been able to document some changes on the ground. Aluja used to be surrounded by farmland, but if you look now, all this land has been dried out. We know farms were burned. If you look at satellite images from the same place in 2014, or let's say 2013, you see the land was completely green. Now on the map you can see it's nothing but a desert. And we know that after burning these lands, they transformed them into fish farms for the troops who live now in Aluja. That fact was confirmed by several sources in Tikrit and even by high-ranking members of the government. In Baghdad, we met up again with Marwan al-Jabari, who has embarked upon another push to lobby authorities. Thank you for receiving us. 
Today I'm representing all the tribal leaders of Salah al-Din. We'd like to submit another request to the ministry, asking that residents of the region be allowed to return home. Listen, we need to get the green light from security forces to ensure that there's no danger and that we can allow people to return home. According to the minister, the threat of reprisals against the tribe is very real. Sorry, but yes, there is an obsession surrounding the residents of Aluja. Some of them are afraid of returning home and are asking for special forces to protect them. Today we're working on these requests and we hope that their return will be possible soon. But after seven years of waiting, the official position sounds more like a pretext to delay the return of residents as long as possible. When you're removed from all the decision-making in the country, even when you're a significant community, when you're displaced and your requests to return home are refused, when you have to apply unjust orders, which were designed simply to punish you, naturally, you can feel like you've become a second-class citizen. And in my opinion, that's not going to change overnight. Sunnis and Shia have been punishing one another for a problem that occurred 1,400 years ago. How can you imagine that we wouldn't be punished for events that happened just 20 years ago? Lucille Wasserman with Cole Stangler revisiting Tikrit for France 24. Well, that's all from this week's edition. Of course, you can catch it and the previous editions as well on our website at france24.com. More news coming up very shortly. Thanks for watching.